Hey guys, welcome to week two of Dr. Zach and Chantel's awesome podcast. I'm Chantel Desjardins, that is Dr. Zach Levine. He is the best ER doctor I have ever met in Montreal. Um, Maybe the only. You're the only ER doctor I know in Montreal, but I assume you're pretty good as well. So it works out. Um, go with that. Yeah, totally. This is week two, week one, we touched on what to do with the kids, what to do with the old people, whether my girlfriend was overreacting when she wouldn't let me use her uh, bathroom after feeding me coffee on the balcony. She's still mad at me, by the way. Whenever I talk about people on the podcast, they get mad. Oh, they, oh she saw it. Yeah, she, she saw it. Is she, is she mad at me or just you? I mean, I just, I wouldn't necessarily like, um, you know, Is call her over? right now. I wouldn't come over today. Either Can way, she'll use the bathroom. Yeah, <laughs> you can't use her bathroom, so it doesn't matter. No. All right. Uh, today, sure. still Corona themed at summertime pools. What are going to happen with pools? How you, uh, you know, if you catch it, if you don't catch it, that's one thing we're going to talk on. Uh, we'll talk about vodka. Yeah. Vodka. Yeah, I love vodka on the yeah, show. Yeah. Not just for drinking anymore, apparently. <laughs> right. Bathing. <laughs> bathing you can bathe in. yeah i mean i wouldn't bathe in like a vodka soda necessarily anyways we'll touch on that um protesting uh are we gonna see a spike because of all these protesters and uh should i take up smoking to avoid getting corona as if you needed another reason to take as up as if smoking. i needed i was thinking you know what i'm gonna do in my late 30s is take up smoking and now here i go <laughs> yeah, just add it to the list of reasons why smoking is a healthy it's habit it's a healthy habit, you know, that and crack. Um, so let's get to it. Pools. How are we going to do it? You have a bunch of kids. Are they going to go to a pool? How are you going to avoid, you know, can it, can it go through the water? Is it just airborne? Is this a bad idea? Do you just keep your kids home and put them in the bathtub? <laughs> uh, swim. Take them swimming. So it, it won't live in the water for very long or at all. You know, in chlorinated water, in a big body of water like a lake, it's not really a concern that you're going to get it while being underwater. The concern, like any other time you may catch it, is in the air. So, you know, as whenever we socialize, we tend to get close to each other and then we talk to each other. And then, especially if people are coughing or sneezing or spitting or yelling, then there's aerosolization of this virus and they can pass it to each other. So, uh, transmission is just the same way, it's by these particles. And if there's a way, uh, and though we did talk about how kids, especially younger kids, are not uh, hugely affected, and it doesn't seem like they're big uh, transmitters of it. We, since we spoke, there was actually a letter by several thousand, uh, mainly pediatricians in Quebec, asking the government to set free the, the children, 12 and under, because they're not big spreaders and because they don't get it much and because they've been essentially in lockdown. Right. Uh, but I, I think reasonable precautions still prevail. So the pool itself is almost completely irrelevant because the water itself doesn't, doesn't aid and abet the transmission. It's only when you're out of the water, which, you know, we spend a fair time out of the water when we go to a pool because we're socializing. Mm -hmm. And then we should still be careful. So we should still keep our different distance from people who aren't in our same household. And when we're out on the side of the pool, we should keep our distance, we should wear masks, etc. We should do whatever we need to do to you know, keep ourselves and sometimes more importantly, keep other people safe. I wonder if they're going to set up rules, you know, like uh, your kids are only going to be allowed in from 1215 till 1219 or, you know, for 10 minutes and then they got to get out. So the next people's kids, like, do you think that would be a good way to kind of monitor it? Or is there going to be just a line of children waiting for the next, the last kid to get out and, you know, just have like a loop? I think it's going to be some, they'll have to do something to limit the numbers. So like a, a grocery store or a big, any big store, what they're doing is limiting the numbers who get in. So whether they do it by appointment or whether they do it by first come first served. Uh, but the problem with that is then if someone, you know, if, if the first coming people end up, that sounded wrong, but I'm sorry about that. If the people <laughs> who come to the pool first uh, can stay as long as they want, then they can potentially just stay all day. So I think they'll have to give people a certain amount of time they can use the pool. Well, we have a doctor in the house. I was going to ask. I mean, we've always heard the rumor that if you pee in the pool, it turns the chlorine a different color. Now, I've never done it. One, because it's disgusting. But more than the fact it's disgusting, I've never wanted to be the one to turn the pool green. Right. Myth or fact? Well, in my experience, 
peeing in the pool does not change the chemicals. <laughs> so it's a myth. Essentially, the, the, the chemicals that would do that would be inactivated by going in pool water. Uh, so, so I don't encourage anyone to urinate or do anything else in a pool, frankly, because I don't know if you've been at public pools, but every now and then they get closed because some, usually a child does something in a pool that they're not supposed to. Uh, but yeah, exactly. That's it. Well, sometimes vomit also. Sometimes oh, I see. The local YMCA, they often have to close it down after lessons because a young one has vomited in the pool. I see. Okay. So that myth though is debunked. I like that. We're going to, we're going to debunk more myths as the show is going on. Oh, that's fun. That's fine, right? Um, George Floyd at the protest, very worthy protest, very worthy uh, event, except the only thing I could think of while watching the news was everyone is too close together. Please protest on the other sides of the street. Are we going to see a flare up? That's the concern. I think here, I don't know for sure. Um, I got the impression that here people are actually pretty good about wearing masks. So that was actually kind of impressive. Depending on where you, where you looked, where these protests happened, some places they weren't. So Potentially, yes. You know, I don't think anyone knows for sure, but for sure there's the potential that we're going to see an increase in cases. If people are wearing masks, then that helps a lot, right? I mean, that'll prevent them from spreading it to someone who's within six feet of them. And then if they do the other things we've talked about as well, but uh, there probably is more aerosolization as well when they're yelling and screaming, you know, people get excited at these things for good reason. So there's definitely risk that some of these people will pick it up. And and the worry is often, you know, that again, we'll have more asymptomatic spreaders and that those people will pass it to people who will be symptomatic and especially people who are older, who are sicker, who can actually get really, really sick with this. What about this New Brunswick doctor that came to, the, came to Quebec, picked up the virus, went right back and gave it to, you know, the whole community. Thoughts on that? That's a crazy story. Crazy story. Um, it's also a very upsetting story. So uh, I think a lot of people, their first reaction, including mine, to be honest, was, you know, this person was so irresponsible. He came to a place where he knew there was a lot of virus and he brought it back to a place where there was essentially apparently no confirmed cases in two weeks. And he brought it there and he made people sick, mm. um, which is one way to look at it for sure. I think there's a few things we don't know. And there's a few things that have made it more uh, upsetting. Number one is the amount of vitriol and also the amount apparently of racist vitriol there has been directed at him. He happens to be a gentleman from Africa who practices medicine here. Uh, so, and the, the other issue is, you know, we don't know, he, he drove directly to somewhere in Quebec, picked up his daughter, who he had to pick up because apparently the mother had to go to a funeral in Africa and came directly home. So, you know, just crossing the border into Quebec doesn't mean that you're gonna catch COVID. You don't catch it by opening your window as you're driving on the highway. So uh, it's quite possible he didn't catch it in Quebec. He may well have caught it from someone in New Brunswick and he wasn't showing symptoms. Now, maybe his daughter did have it. Maybe he caught it from her. That's a possibility also. Um, but it's become really a very upsetting story. And I know that his license has been suspended, which is, you know, it's a huge deal for a doctor to have their license suspended. You know, what a, a lot of us don't have spent our entire lives doing this and we don't, we're not really that much good for that much else, you know, I mean, <laughs> what a dog that we get, but it, no, it's very upsetting. It's a big part of your, of your identity. Your identity for sure. And so now the truth is, you know, he came here and the law is in New Brunswick. He was supposed to self quarantine for two weeks. And so I think that was the real problem. And I think he made a mistake. I think he didn't, he probably forgot or he probably didn't even know, or I don't know. You know I don't know him. I don't know the whole situation, but and it's a really, and it's tragic. And I'm sure the people who have gotten sick as a result of it are furious for good reason. But at the same time, we have to, we have to remember he's a human. We're all human. And, and, and we still, so he made a mistake. We still don't know really where he caught it. It's quite possible he caught it in New Brunswick. Remember, there's this latency, right? You can catch it and then only have symptoms days later or not even have symptoms at all. So he's certainly getting blamed for coming here, catching the virus and bring it back. Maybe that's the case but it's turned into a bit of a, a witch hunt against him. And that's, and that's really a shame. Yeah, that's a sad story. I mean, hopefully what second chances, you know, gets his license. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, this will, hopefully everyone will be fine. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, I just read actually that he had, um, he had said that he was going to stop practicing in New Brunswick at the beginning, beginning of August anyway. So I'm not sure if he's moving or going elsewhere, but uh, you know, in a very small place, he's not, exactly anonymous and so uh, it's possible he, he wouldn't feel comfortable practicing there anymore but 
another topic we can talk about another time is doctors who make mistakes as humans and uh and the fallout of that it's a big uh, it's a big interest of mine cool. not just because i make mistakes <laughs> all right well we'll do that too all right let's talk about um vodka so it's my of choice uh breakfast of champions <laughs> and it is flying off the shelves because people are doing diy hand sanitizers hmm. what are your yeah. thoughts can i make like a, a vodka soda and then dip my hand in and i'm also protected so vodka i wouldn't recommend it as a hand sanitizer so essentially the recommendation is that you have 60 percent ethanol which is a type of alcohol uh, in in your hand sanitizer so a minimum of, of 60 percent it can be higher than that and it's worth noting that uh, vodka is usually more like 35 to 40 percent so number one it's not alcoholic enough mm. to be an effective hand sanitizer um, and if you do want to make your own hand sanitizer there are as you know recipes on the internet uh, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's also worth noting that there are different types of alcohol and just as a public service, I'll mm -hmm. mention that you shouldn't be drinking any other types of alcohol either, like things that are used for de-icer and antifreeze. Oh, um, you don't think people know that? I don't know if people know it and some, uh, the truth is sometimes people actually come in uh, intoxicated with those things. Uh, really? And sometimes it's an accident, so like, like sometimes I don't do pediatric, but I know sometimes, you know, like Antifreeze is often like the color of Gatorade, right? Why do they do so, that? Why do they make it a pretty color, enticing to kids and pets? And well, I don't think they do it for that reason. I think they do it so you can see it more easily uh, when it leaks. Mm. I, I can't speak for them, but that's what I think. But you're right. That's why kids sometimes drink it. And the problem with the toxic alcohols, of which there are three, isopropyl alcohol, which is rubbing alcohol, methanol, and ethylene glycol the problem with those is that they're actually really toxic so depending on which one you ingest and i definitely have seen some people drink it uh drink them uh and hopefully not for the reason of preventing coronavirus but you know people do things for all sorts of reasons and sometimes as a mistake but they can be really toxic depending on which one you ingest it can destroy your liver it can cause seizures it can even cause death so if you're going to be drinking alcohol make sure it's ethanol uh, and I wouldn't be drinking anything that's as high percentage as we were talking about, like 60% and higher. That's, right. that's too high. Okay, too high. I'll cross that off my, uh, my list uh, of beverages to serve at my next dinner party. Okay. Good, thank you. Good. And should I take up smoking? <laughs> I thought we established. All, all these we established studies. Studies. <laughs> we have established that I probably should not take up smoking, but these studies coming out now showing that there's a, a lower prevalence of COVID in smokers but other studies are saying that's ridiculous. Don't take up smoking to stop Corona. It's just the fact that the test study was so small that uh, it, was, it was a fluke. Those are funny studies. I actually wanna see them. Uh, I, I mean, so I haven't read these studies. I can't imagine there's any validity whatsoever to them. And, and as you know, you know, statistics, you know, you really have to read the study and see how big it was and see how well done it was. Mm -hmm. there, there's no, feasible way in my mind how uh, smoking could actually be uh, good for you in the context, oh, in any context, <laughs> but in the context of COVID, because, you know, COVID attacks the lungs and especially in people who are extra susceptible to it and people who smoke, their lungs are, uh, you know, they're just weaker. They're, um, you know, we, smoking is among the things that we know lead people to do more poorly when they catch COVID. So, uh, I would say it's just another reason not to take up smoking or to take this opportunity to uh, stop smoking. You know, a lot of people are using this uh, forced break for a lot of people to do new things. For example, start an amazing new podcast, right? Oh, like us. So, right? Right? Uh, but, you know, I think everyone should have a goal, especially, you know, if they're not working or whatever, but, you know, we all have our creative juices that are still flowing. So that could be a great goal for someone. You know, some people are getting in shape. Some people are uh, um, drinking less mm. and some people are uh, maybe they're going to quit smoking. So that would be, that would be a great outcome. Now, are you on the, on the side of the fence that is starting to work out more and is eating healthier or like there's two types of people and there's the other people that are just kind of like chilling on the couch, eating Doritos and watching, you know, all of Netflix. Well, I get made fun of a lot because um, whenever I've gone on, media. I always talk about good diet and exercise and whatnot. And I, I do have 
I do exercise. I like it and I know it's important for me, but my diet is, is poor to be perfectly honest. I try, but I, get, I have a, a pretty bad sweet tooth from my, I blame my mother. You know, everyone's, there's certainly a lot of people who I've heard from who have gained weight during this pandemic, no question about it, because they've been stuck inside. But, you know, as we talked about last time with your mom, you know, get out there, you know, as long as you're not close to people. And the, the great outdoors is now beautiful, finally, in Canada. And as, you don't have to be close to people because we have such a massive country. You can right. have your six feet around you and still be active and still enjoy yourself and enjoy the fresh air without potentially catching COVID. So get out there and be active. Get out there. Um, can, I, can I go on a plane? Am I going to get it if I, if I go visit my mom in Winnipeg? Like, do I have to wear, you know, a full hazmat suit? On you, the personally? Uh, or in general? Like, uh, <laughs> like should, so, I, uh, should I hold it? Should I not go to use the bathroom? Should I not touch anything? Should I just not bother going? My girlfriend, my girlfriend is driving 15 hours from Calgary to Winnipeg, and she's going to stay in a trailer on her parents' lot and not go in the house and she's going to stay there for two weeks and they're going to have all their outdoor meals. Like it seems like a lot of work, you know, like I like my family, but do I like my family that much? Well, also she's driving. So she doesn't have the same dilemma you do about getting into a plane. So yeah. as far as anyway, I mean, she's being very cautious. I have to say, like, she's a really good daughter, your friend, mm -hmm. uh, as far as plane travel, you know, it's certainly going to open up. My understanding is that airlines are generally saying that people have to wear masks when they go on the plane. So essentially airplanes, um, airplanes are good in the sense that they have very sophisticated filtration systems. So they're actually quite good at getting rid of viruses, but you know, you're still in an enclosed space. And you know, if you're within six feet of someone, then you can definitely, definitely catch it. So you have to do all those things that we've talked about. Essentially wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, and don't touch your face, specifically your mouth, your nose, and your eyes and do all the things that you need to do to protect yourself. Right. Um, and then, but even more importantly, in the case of your mom is, you know, she's older and you have to be careful. So you're going to have to figure out once you get there, how you're going to protect her. And a lot of us are in that situation. I, I feel the exact same way with my parents. I really want to see them. And even if, even without the whole air travel problem, we have the dilemma of how do we see them and not put them in danger of getting quite sick? Yeah. Like I'm almost tempted to like pitch a tent, you know, drive 30 hours and pitch a tent in her backyard. And I'm like, ah, maybe I'll just wait till there's a vaccine. Like that's a lot of effort, you know? It is, but uh, vaccine, uh, yeah, vaccine's a little while away. Right. Hopefully. Yeah. All right. Fine. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry Thanks, to bring it down. Uh, Debbie Downer over here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's end on a fun thing. Do you have anything else that people have stuck up their hoo-hoo's? <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't that much. They, um, there's, I recently saw a lady with a, who thought her a butt plug might be up there. Wow. I didn't, I've never, and I, I'm, I'm really very innocent. And so I wasn't familiar with butt plugs before. <laughs> I'm not, not totally sure what, I mean, I, anyway, I, I guess I get the uh, concept I mean, generally. Do you know the brand name? Was it, was it, <laughs> was it? Well, of course I examined it when I, when I removed it. I examined it closely. <laughs> and, uh, of course, it was decontaminated. Uh, no, I don't know the brand. No, in fact, this uh, there was no evidence that there was actually a butt plug in there. So oh. sometimes people think that they have a foreign body in them, right. in one of their orifices, and they actually don't have. That's not that's not the only time I've seen that where people came in and they, and they thought um, I have or someone else has put something into one of my orifices, and uh, I think it's still in there. And then we do the examination, and it's not. And, that's a good outcome, I would say, right? You know. Right, a phantom yeah. plug. That's a. That's a <laughs> this is never so, going to get old to me. <laughs> but you know, it is uh, as a public service announcement. If there is something left in there, it is important to get it taken out. Right. All right. Doctor Zach says, "Get it out. Yeah. Get it out of yeah. there." Born bodies in the body uh, need not to stay there because right. the body doesn't like them. They can cause infection. They can cause serious problems. Just don't. Just say no to the. <laughs> you know, to the stuff. Um, okay. I think we're going to leave it there. I mean, I don't know how you'd top that. So, uh, this has uh, been a wrap for episode two, Dr. Zach Levine, ER doctor in uh, Montreal, the best ER doctor I know. And only. And only. And I'm Chantal Desjardins. Guys, have a great week. We'll see you next week.